secret. And of course, you know about the the, the Donald Trump ties. I got a pile of ties. My boys all got a tie. So, James, you, know. you glossed over one thing I'd like to you to touch on, okay, about the W story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, how did you meet him? Uh, but people don't know what you will not say publicly is he requested your present. He was taking pictures of you. He did. And he, and I'll let you, this is James time here. Cap, Cap, Cap McCormick, mm-hmm. man. Take a few minutes of how you met him. And also that he used mm-hmm. your Letter. advice and words. Ta- go ahead. Yeah. Take, take the mic there, Cap. And I want to hear this again. This wow. is so cool. Well, let me tell you, you know, when I came back, I faced, um, you know, some of this, um, uh, you know, that we had protesters. Okay. So don't think that protesting was just, you know, during the, uh, Vietnam generation, we faced our, our protesters as well. Um, and, uh, most of them were, you know, again, the same jackaloons that you see now, you know, out there running around, uh, you know, screaming for Palestine, screaming, you know, shit, they just find something to, you know, to, to cry about. I mean, it, you know, transgenders having babies, all this other garbage. Um, you know, um, so when I saw some of this happening and the effects on some of the Iraq War veterans, in particular, well, you know, I wrote a letter to President and George W. Bush, and I said, essentially, sir, I want you to know this is who I am, and I gave him my name and my unit. I said, this is what we've done. And, you know, uh, while you are seeing people pushing back and and saying that there's no weapons of mass destruction, I can tell you this, that, you know, what is a chemical, uh, what is a chemical uh, artillery? Uh, We uncovered several uh, chemical artillery shells. So, you know, that's a weapon of mass destruction, people. And so nobody can deny that. We had soldiers that were wounded because they used these chemical shells as roadside bombs. So we've had soldiers that were, you know, that literally got nerve gas while they were overseas. So I don't know who keeps saying this this garbage that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Then they come back and they say, well, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be. Come on, man. Don't be stupid. Uh, Al Qaeda gets a hold of that. uh, Number one. Saddam shouldn't have had any of it, but he did, and he had a lot of it. Um, so, uh, and Saddam was a bad guy, unbelievably bad guy, um, and I can I can vouch for that on on many many fronts. Um, so when I wrote this letter, it was because I was partially infuriated uh, dealing with these people. Uh, I mean, dude, they would they would show up at your welcome home ceremonies, okay? There would be 99% of the people would be good, but there would be a jackaloon out there or two or three holding a sign, no blood for oil. You know, we support the troops. We don't support the war. I'm like, yeah, get the hell out of here. You know, it's like, uh, I'm not ashamed of anything I did over there. Um, And I sleep pretty good with all of it. So writing that letter to President Bush was based mainly on the fact that I saw him. That's my commander in chief. And you're talking bad about us. You're talking bad about him. And I can see this spiraling, you know. We watched the protest, Uh, Craig. You saw the protest after Vietnam. You saw how those guys were treated. I saw that as a kid, and I watched that demoralize my father. And I was not going to sit back and just say, well, I'll just ignore it, go take my uniform off. No, bullshit. I wasn't going to do that. Um, So I wrote a letter to the president. And the president, I explained to him that we have pride and that we are honored and proud of the job that we've done. And I explained to him some of the missions that we were on. And I said, from Baghdad, from from Bunker Hill to Baghdad, was the famous saying that I made in there. Uh, you know, there are many of us that are honored to serve in this, in the United States military, and we will go back again and again and again, if necessary, to defeat this enemy. And next thing you know, I get a call and said, hey, the president wants to meet you in Morgantown, West Virginia. And um, I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. And I mean, literally, kind of like we're talking on, the, you know, on this radio show right now. I don't get excited over those things, man. 
Because it's like, I've been to a lot of these things before. Okay, so you're going to have me stand out in a crowd with 10,000 other people. That's what I figured. Well, I was wrong. When I got there, the first thing I got done was I got picked up by Carl Rove. Carl Rove said, you're going to sit beside me. And as I was sitting beside Carl Rove and talking to him, you know, Carl Rove, <clears throat> and who I still talk to today from time to time, um, he said, the president wants to meet with you. Um, and I went back to this hallway and there was, you know, Senator Shelley Moore Capito and some of our elected officials and a lot of the, you know, the, the, the head people from WVU, they were all standing out in the hallway and they said, um, uh, all of you stand here. And, and they said, uh, now I was a Lieutenant, Lieutenant McCormick, you come back with us in this room. The president wants to meet with you in person. Out of all those people, he pulled me out of that crowd and said, you go back there. And there was me and there was one Secret Service agent and there was the president and a photographer came in to take pictures. And the president sat down with me, of course, gave me one of his presidential coins, which my wife carries around, by the way. Um, she becomes the caretaker of all these things that I get. And uh, um, sets me down in a chair and says, McCormick, tell me what's really going on over there. And I gave him an evaluation and a briefing like I would give to the commanders overseas. And you got to understand, you know, I had been wounded and I was starting to go through, you know, I was still going in and out of the hospital. Uh, you know, I was in and out of, uh, you know, you know, different units and stuff. But I was on my feet. What I wanted to do and what I told the president was, is, you know, before I, uh, we left, uh, he says, well, was there anything I can do for you? I said, yes, sir. I said, I'd like to get back over there to continue what I'm doing, you know, because I think the mission's important. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, he shook my hand and, and uh, we departed. And, um, you know, I got, I mean, I got a phone number that I could call and get a message directly to him. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't like the hotline to the white house. Um, and that's just the way things went for the rest of that tenure. So that, that occurred in 2005. And, um, yeah, that was the, uh, that was the president Bush uh, trip. And we shared many letters after that and communications. And then after he, um, left, um, you know, left the, uh, the white house, um, then, uh, we shared some emails. Um, and you know, to this day, I still follow them and, and track everything that, that I can and, and offer them letters of compassion and, and kindness, you know, especially whenever his father died. Um, you know, I, I got a, a letter about that as well. So, you know, um, it was a good relationship. It was a great meeting. So there you go. Secrets from the Inside with Captain James McCormick. <laughs>